good afternoon. Um, my name's Keith Mitchell. Um, as you probably gathered, I'm not from round here. Um, the weather at least is familiar. Um, anyway, I'm going to be talking to you today about something that I've had a lot of experience about, um, which is running internet exchanges. I hope that this information is um, useful or, or at least enlightening to you. Um, I'm going to cover a few topics, um, just a little bit about myself, um, some basic principles of how do internet service providers interconnect with each other on the internet, um, a little bit about the history of internet exchanges, a little bit about the models for, for building internet exchanges, how they're operated, how they, um, they work technically and um, operationally. Uh, talk a little bit about internet exchange security, I think there's some, some interesting topics there. How to set up your own internet exchange. Um, and um, a little bit more, I think, particularly relevant um, to, um, to perhaps the audience here is um, um, some background about regional internet exchanges. Um, a little bit of my background uh, summary. I've been doing this internet operation stuff for far too long. Um, the current thing that I'm doing is I'm running a body called the UK Network Operation Forum. It's very similar to, to Nanog if you come across that in North America, um, a British equivalent of that. Um, and um, what's new with me? Well, I've just moved to Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I um, I was good enough to get a job here, and now it's time for a change of scene. So here I am. Um, please do let me know if I use any um, phrases or uh, say things in a way which isn't isn't clear, either from a technical or uh, um, cultural point of view. Internet interconnect principles. What happens at an internet exchange point? Basically. Um, at your typical internet exchange, um, there will be a bunch of internet service providers who will have equipment, routers um, in the, um, the same building, which will be a data center usually operated by a company that, that builds itself a co-location provider. Within that building, these ISPs connect together. Uh, sometimes they will run a direct wire between them. Um, sometimes, um, more commonly, there will be a shared interconnect fabric, which is usually uh, one or more ethernet switches. Um, the exchange routing information um, using BGP, Border Gateway Protocol. Um, the exchange of the routing information leads to the exchange of traffic, um, and, and that's done on a bilateral basis. So peers of ISPs will decide, we're going to here, we're going to exchange traffic, let's set up a BGP session. Um, sometimes the exchange operator who actually operates the um, cloud of Ethernet switches will be the same people that own the building and operate the building. Sometimes it'll be a different organization. The people that own the building, um, Polo provider, um, they'll have lots of different customers, ISPs, carriers, content providers, people running portals, um, content distribution, name, cert, name registries, all kinds of things. So what are the advantages of an internet exchange point? It's, it's very simple. Um, it's one place where you can connect everybody. So you run one big fat pipe to a central location. There's lots of other people do that. You get economies of scale. You don't have to route your traffic. Um, over lots of um, bilateral expensive circuits that go one to each of the other ISPs you need to exchange traffic with. Um, in more detail, um, commonly the motivation for setting up an internet exchange is to keep the traffic within a region. So that um, within a country, you don't have to go outside of that country and back in just to talk to, to somebody who's in the next city. Within a city, you don't have to go over to Washington, D.C. and back and talk to somebody who's just down your, your, your road. The numbers vary. Um, but typically um, anywhere between a fifth and a third of the traffic can be local. Um, um, for some um, parts of the world, and Korea has actually got the biggest internet exchange in the world because they have a lot of local content um, that, that, that is of less interest to the rest of the world. Um, what are the other advantages? Reducing your bandwidth cost. Um, if you take that traffic off your expensive long-haul circuit, um, um, that frees up more capacity. Um, it potentially re reduces the, the bill to the upstream ISP that you're, you're buying transit from. Um, fatter, local fatter pipes are cheaper on a local basis, so you get more bandwidth to play with. Um, you're not hopping through lots of indirect um, other, other routers or other locations, so um, it's very good for improving latency as well. As economies of scale, as I said, the basis that internet service providers generally exchange traffic um, at an exchange is, is, is something called peering. I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that later, but the main motivation is it saves you money. Um, and once you've got all these ISPs in the same place, then it starts to create other interesting things in, in that there's a effective market for buying and selling access capacity, um, wholesale internet access, all kinds of things. So 
Peering is, is a very important building block of what makes the internet connect together. Two ISPs decide that um, I'm not going to buy or sell service from you, but um, we can both get advantages from um, having access just to each other's customers. So let's exchange traffic on that basis. Um, and usually, um, unlike buying service from somebody, there's no money changes hands. And it, it's what's called settlement free. Um, when two telephony operators interconnect, then um, the money tends to flow within the direction of who's making the one call to the other. Um, peering agreements between ISPs, um, generally there's no settlement. It's not unheard of, but generally there's no settlement when you're exchanging IP traffic. And it's about bartering perceived equal value. And you will quite often get the situation where a, a big ISP will say, well, I'm only going to peer with other big ISPs, and here's my set of rules for what is a big ISP. And they won't peer with the little guy, but the little guys are peer with each other, and there's a whole kind of food chain. Um, not billing the packets also um, keeps the commercial arrangement simple. You can quite often get a peering agreement on two or three pages, or it's quite often done on a gentleman's handshake basis. Other key principle is, 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 is that of public interconnect. Um, I refer to an IXP internet exchange point throughout my discussion. Uh, more commonly in North America, they're called NAP. Um, easier to pronounce, but less technically accurate uh, network access point. But when I say IXP or NAP, I mean exactly the same thing. Um, the, the point here is that you have a, a single shared fabric that everybody's connected to. It's usually Ethernet. There are other technologies that work as well. Um, but it creates a, an open medium in which many-to-many -many connectivity becomes possible. Um, that doesn't mean that you have to exchange traffic with everybody else on the exchange. Um, what it means is you have the possibility of doing so. Actually, exchanging the traffic requires um, a bilateral agreement. Other models exist. Um, I talked about private interconnect earlier. Um, and um, I'll say a little bit more about, about transit shortly. Technologies, um, back when people first started doing this, 10 meg Ethernet was the, um, the most common thing. Um, that was used to connect the, the ISP's routers to the switch. At the bigger exchanges, we had more than one switch. We used um, 100 meg FIDI. Um, but usually, most of these exchanges were one switch in one building. Um, six, seven years ago, 100 meg Ethernet came along, uh, pretty much superseded all the 10 meg and the, the FIDI. Few exchanges used ATM. Um, Ameritech um, ran a, a big exchange in Chicago that was ATM based. I think it was the, the most successful of these. Um, but one gig Ethernet is now pretty ubiquitous. Um, 10 gig Ethernet, um, a lot of the exchange operators were very much the bleeding edge of 10 gig, and there was some that was, that was more painful than it needed to be. Um, but typically, it's used in the core of network between the switches, between the sites. Um, but the bigger exchanges where they're pushing maybe 50, 60, 100 gig of traffic, um, the 10 gig quite often used to connect the, um, the actual uh, members to the exchange as well. That's scary because there aren't any um, technologies that are going to be a whole lot better than 10 gig um, anywhere obvious. Um, and that's a separate story. Um, one way of bodging around the 10 gig limit is to use things like WDM, um, MPLS, um, other kinds of um, bandwidth multiplying technologies. Even Ethernet is good stuff. Uh, it's cost effective, it's high bandwidth, it's cheap, um, gives you more capacity than most users or SMEs might ever want to use. Very common now. Um, it works between one rack and another over copper. It will work over metropolitan distances, tens of miles, kilometers. Most ISPs actually use it. Um, it's almost universally switches together. Um, and really, if you go out and buy a switch now, um, the price premium for a port that will do one gig over copper compared to 100 meg over copper is, 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 is negligible. Um, and there's, there's, there's some good vendors, there's some good products out there. Cisco, Extreme, Force 10, Foundry are all, are all doing um, state-of-the-art switches that will um, meet internet exchange requirements, no problem. So a um, little bit about internet exchange history. Um, been plenty of ageist remarks in the other room earlier on already. Um, but. Um, we first started doing links in um, London in 1994. Um, ten years later, for the 10th anniversary, um, we donated the um, switches to the Science Museum in London. So if you were doing your tourist thing in London and you go to the Science Museum, which is worth visiting in its own right, then up there in their Digitopolis exhibit, there's a, a Ethernet switch that I tabled and labeled um, in a glass case. And uh, so therefore, it must be history, I guess. That was um, quite an interesting experience. As I said, set up in 1994. Back then, there were only five ISPs in the whole of the UK. Um, I worked for one of them, Pipex. 
And, and literally there were five pipes out the country and they all went to the US and each one went to a different one. So if you were sitting in um, London connected to Demon and you want to send some email to your mate in Cambridge and Pipex, then literally it went from Demon across the Atlantic, Britain, across the May East Exchange in Washington DC to you, you and then back down the pipe to Pipex. Um, obviously that was silly. And you know, these were the days when we were paying maybe $100,000 a year for 128k of capacity. So you can imagine that we, um, we had a pretty strong incentive. Of course, we were all fiercely competing with each other as well. So the idea that one of us would host the exchange and the others wouldn't was, um, was fairly alien. Um, so um, eventually we found this nice building called Tally House, um, which basically just sold space. It didn't try to sell you anything else like circuits or um, um, connectivity. And we put a 10 meg Ethernet hub. I'm sure anyone who's got an Ethernet hub in their bag with them today has probably got more um, capacity more capability than the original link hub. But the important thing is we connect it all together first. We did the engineering, we got the traffic flowing, um, all the, um, the governance stuff, the finance, the legalities, all of that stuff come later. And I think that's a really important principle. Um, history of links, this is not so different from a lot of other internet exchanges all over the, all, all over the world. Um, after a year, we incorporated as a not-profit membership organization. We hired our first full-time employee a year later. Um, by 97, we got 50 members. Um, by 98, we were the first exchange to start going to multiple um, data centers and connecting together. Uh, first exchange to deploy now, uh, one gig traffic in 99. Goes up to 100 members in 2000. Um, 2000, of course, was the, 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 the dot-com silly year, um, but um, we decided to establish Exchange Point as a similar company but on commercial principles in late 2000. Upshot is around now, um, got the, um, the link traffic stat here. Um, these guys are pushing 100 and 105 gig of traffic through the switch fabric. Um, more than that if you, if you count the, um, the private internet. So um, it's quite an interesting challenge to keep that stuff going and flowing. Bigger picture, what are internet exchanges like in Europe? Um, typically, the ones that have been successful have set a neutrality model, they've set up a non-profit membership organization, um, they're not in the hosting or colo business, um, and usually um, they buy space from people who run the building, so they just run the switches. Um, um, there's lots of exchanges, but there's probably about four or five major cities, London, Amsterdam, Frankfurt, Paris, where there, there, there are big exchanges that are pan-European ones. So if you want to go from, say, Ireland to Italy, you might go via Amsterdam. If you want to go from um, uh, France to Sweden, you might go via um, Frankfurt or London. Um, so what they're doing is they're keeping EU traffic in the EU, um, whereas the original mission was to keep domestic traffic within a particular country. Um, most countries have a domestic exchange as well. In fact, a lot of them have more than one now. Uh, but the big guys are, are, again, all pushing several tens of gigs of traffic. Landscape's a little bit different in the US. Um, most of the big exchanges are operated by data center providers. So there's, there's people at Equinix who are NASDAQ listed, uh, the Switch and Data who have got a facility in, in Cleveland amongst many other cities, Paramark down in Florida. And their primary business is selling space. Um, they're certainly not in the ISP business because the ISPs are their customers and they don't want to compete with them. Um, but generally the exchange, the like Equinix call them IBX, is they're run as um, just one more service within that data center. It's a way of attracting people to the data center and extracting more money from them. Um, again, there's a focus on particular cities that are doing the, the, the national and international switching, San Francisco Bay Area, um, Washington DC, um, originally May East, um, various other things now, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles. There's also quite a number of, uh, there's a few other cities like uh, Miami, Atlanta, Seattle, where there's quite a lot of traffic switch as well. Um, but there's lots of little ones as well, which for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to call regional ones. Um, slightly different ball game there. Um, typically volunteer membership organizations, pretty informal governance. Mostly it's local ISPs um, rather than sort of backbone tier one type people that have got together. Uh, consequently lower traffic volumes. As I say, there's lots of them. Um, the two that are, that are physically closest to where we are today um, are in Pittsburgh and, uh, and, and Columbus. Um, and, and these are the ones I'll talk about a bit more later on. Um, again, global perspective on the regional internet exchanges. There was kind of a second wave of these in the late 90s. 
after the, the, the national and, and international ones had, had set up. Some examples that I've been involved in, uh, Manap in, um, in Manchester in England, um, Gothic in, in my, my hometown of Edinburgh in Scotland, um, the HH in Hamburg in Germany. And, and quite often there was a sort of motivation behind these, which is that there's far too much centralisation of the infrastructure in this country. Um, let's not have all the traffic going down south to London and back. Let's stuff it up and open it in, in a local exchange. Um, again, not just the tier one guys, much smaller, um, more universal participation. Um, quite a lot of local government um, kind of jumped on the bandwagon there. It's like, oh, well, we've missed out on the dot-com boom, but we can catch up if we just have our own internet exchange. Um, that's um, a blessing and a curse. Again, hear a little bit more about that. But really, um, like a lot of things that, that boomed in the late 90s, not all of these survived. Okay, a little bit about the, the non-technical stuff, the commercial and governance models. Um, neutrality is really very important. Um, the whole point of internet exchanges is one place in the region or the city that you go to to connect. Um, and um, this, if you've got several of them in the same city, then you have to go to multiple of them, and then it costs more, and then you've lost the advantage. So they're kind of a natural monopoly. Um, which means, of course, that whoever gets to control this monopoly um, is in a position to um, abuse it. Um, so there's lots of risk if you don't set up the governance right, that it's not neutral, that there's abuse by one party um, or conflict of interest. Um, there's some principles there. Um, successful internet exchanges, they're generally not owned or operated a house by a single ISP or carrier. That's not to say there aren't examples of it working perfectly well. They're not transit providers. Um, they're, they're not, they, 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 they don't resell IP connectivity to the rest of the world. They only enable connections between their, their, their participants. And they're not national or international backbone. Quite in, in less developed internet markets, um, Middle East, Asia Pacific, um, there are quite often things called the BLA Internet Exchange, but actually they're not internet exchanges, they're actually um, the national um, PC telco has got a monopoly on internet transit and they're calling it that because they can. Um, collocation, the actual building you're in, having that neutral is pretty important as well. Um, in Europe, as I say, there's independent commercial companies who are purely in the business of providing space. Um, in the US, um, they're tending to, 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 to host, to run the switch fabric as well of the exchange. But again, that doesn't have to be any less neutral. Um, one place, carriers do a lot of polo, um, sell space to the customers. Um, the idea of putting um, an internet exchange inside the telco jail um, is just one that's not at all popular. A bit more about neutrality principles. Um, you don't have to comply to all of these to have a successful internet exchange. If you don't comply to any of them, you won't have a successful internet exchange. What works is, is, is very much tailored to the, the community that operates it. But don't keep your members. Um, treat them all the same. Um, don't get into the business of long distance um, or international um, backhaul or, or carriage. Don't go into exclusivity with, with, with various parties. Um, to say, don't be a, a wholesale ISP. Um, um, don't um, step over the line of being on a wholesale ISP by, by sharing in somebody else's revenues. Um, don't connect outside the metro area, confine your, with the service that you have to, to just the colo site and don't get into the business of running local tail to every building in the city. Um, and um, being in multiple colo sites is usually okay, but that can be politically quite sensitive. And again, previous speaker was talking about differences between, um, between Germany and, and the US and uh, we had no problem. Well, we had some problem connecting our sites together in, in, in London, um, but the, the German exchange operators, I know, had a very long battle in, in getting out more than one site. Um, there's lots of different models that, 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 that apply um, in um, Brussels, um, Lisbon, um, Catalonia. Uh, the National Academic Network runs the, um, the, the Internet Exchange, and that works mostly fine. Um, I've talked already about the not-for-profit membership organisations. That's by far the most common model. I've talked about um, Links in London, another very large and successful one is Amsterdam in Amsterdam. I think the most successful North American membership exchange is in Seattle. Um, all the commercial providers. Another model is you actually have a company, but the shareholders are some of the, the exchange members like the Mix in Milan or the, the, the JTI at Tokyo. Um, I have this principle um, which I apply, which is that the internet survives on a, on a balance of competition and coordination. Um, too much competition and you get a whole lot of private standards and nothing interoperate. Um, too much coordination and, and you finish up with monopolies and, and centrally planned economies which, which stifle innovation. 
I think this applies to, to governance models, the, 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 the environment, the internet exchanges work, and there, there are advantages and disadvantages. Commercial ones can be very flexible, um, which is just something new. We don't have to take the members in order to authorization to, to engage in a new project. Um, they can maybe ride some of the short-term market flips a bit better, but there's always going to be pressure on them to be less neutral, to go after the revenue opportunities. Nonprofit ones work very well, but they do need a certain critical mass to be viable. Uh, volunteer ones, well, they don't use a lot of resources, um, but um, they can sometimes be a bit of hate. It's, How do I join this exchange? Oh, well, you have to try and track down this guy. It's impossible to reach his name is not on the website. Um, and they're captured by, you know, maybe one volunteer will do so much stuff that they feel it's their personal property or, 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 or they're also subject to, to just apathy. Nobody can be bothered volunteering. They've all got day jobs. Public sector ones can work very well. Again, um, they're less common. There is a monopoly danger there. There is a danger of them, them being hijacked by political influence. Okay, so um, you, you, you've heard the first part of the talk. You think, well, one of these internet exchanges. Maybe, maybe I could have one of these. How do I? I could be cool. How do I go up and how do I go about setting one up? Um, first step is you've got to have some critical math. Um, uh, an internet exchange with one ISP at it is, is not really any value. Um, experience suggests that five is the magic number. If you get less than five, then it's probably not worth doing. It won't necessarily be self-sustaining. Um, and of course, because all these people will be in the same physical location, they will potentially be in the same market, they will compete with each other. Um, depending on how cutthroat that competition has been, getting people to trust each other in environment like that is not easy. Generally, what you need to do is you need to get all the technical people in the room together and, and, and sort of lock up all the salespeople, um, um, and, and then you can usually identify common benefits that will, um, that will um, get people to, to trust each other and get the thing going. Um, quite a good idea if you're setting up a membership organization, association, have some kind of member understanding that everyone signs up. Um, if you're starting a commercial exchange, you're running it at a company, um, the principles are a little bit different. You can use like discounting strategies, the first five people get it for free, the second ten people get it for 50% um, off, to encourage people to come on board. Um, and and that, that, that can work reasonably well as well. But as I said, I think the, um, the focus is get the traffic moving first. Um, an internet exchange that doesn't have a traffic graph on its website is not a real internet exchange because it doesn't have any traffic. It may have some wonderful website with all this stuff about governance and all the wonderful events they've had, but if they're not actually shifting packets, it's not real. Do that first. You're running an ISP, um, you um, want to connect to an internet exchange, what do you need? Well, the key thing is you need your own autonomous system number. Um, and that's something that you need. If you're taking transit from more than one ISP, you connect to more than one upstream, you need an AS number anyway. Um, you need your own provider independent address space. Um, by far the most straightforward way to, that is to get that, um, not for everyone, is to become um, a member of, a, to become a, a reg an internet registry a body that does that. It's American Registry for Internet Numbers. They're meeting in Montreal over the next few days. Um, South in Latin America, it's LACNIC. Um, Europe, it's right in C. There's, 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 there's two or three others. Other thing you need is Box can do BGP. Um, most Cisco and Juniper routers just do this out the box. Um, you can buy kit from other vendors. Um, um, I'm not so sure that their BGP implementations are, are completely up to scratch, but if that's an issue, um, there are some good open source um, Unix um, BGP implementations to software like BGPD, Flag, will, 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 will certainly do it. You need to put box um, into a toll facility where there is actual internet exchange. Once upon a time, it was really expensive, and you had to spend like ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars to connect to internet exchange. These days, you can buy the box off of eBay. Um, you can get personal um, polo space for fifty bucks a month, something like that. And and you know, um, some people have strange hobbies. My strange hobby is I run my own AS. Um, Just, just, just to prove it, here's the, um, the entry from the, the right database, which says what my routing policy is in terms of what other AS I connect to. And, um, so, as I said, it's a slightly strange hobby, but it, it's within the means of most ISPs these days to, to, to connect to an exchange. 
Um, so basically, you want to set up an internet exchange. It's not rocket science. People have been doing this for ages. Lots of help available. Um, good resources. Um, EP.net website lists all the internet exchanges in the world by continent. Uh, Packet Clearinghouse are a great organization, a um, nonprofit based in California. They do a lot of outreach work to developing countries to help them set up their internet exchanges. Um, European exchanges are a very strong position. They've had enough resources to set up their own um, association called EuroIX, which again does a lot of work helping um, new exchanges get set up. Uh, another European body, RIPE, that's been around for a long time, has a working group that's specifically dedicated to the internet. Okay, security. Um, I'm not a security expert, but um, it struck me that this is a topic that's liable to be of interest to this audience. Um, the biggest issue with internet exchanges is you've got a common, which is basically shared by everybody. Typically it's a single ethernet, um, typically it's a single subnet, um, and when you've got boxes that are under different network management domains that are um, being connected to that, there's certainly the scope for some interesting things to go wrong. Um, very early history of internet exchanges, um, they would be a dumb hub, um, or um, they would even be old-fashioned, I, mean, I don't know, is there anyone old enough room to remember yellow thick ethernet cable? But, um, but the point is that um, it's a common medium. If you use that kind of technology, it's extremely easy to wiretap, and if you're party C, and parties A and B are exchanging traffic, it's very easy to tap into that. Um, typically, um, these things are not encrypted. Um, so, um, Ethernet switches came along, they made life a whole lot easier, a lot more safer. Um, that's not to say that they don't introduce risks of their own, but clearly Ethernet switching, at least you get away from the wiretapping issue. What are the things that can go wrong at Internet Exchange? Broadcast storms are by far the worst. Um, Associated with that, um, connecting layer two switching devices so that the Ethernet switches aren't just owned by the exchange operator but by third parties as well. Um, switches don't always do what it says on the tin um, in terms of um, switching the traffic to the right port. Uh, broadcast multicast traffic does not scale well. Um, too much of that and you're in trouble. Um, ARP traffic um, is a necessary evil that has risks associated with it. Um, there are various um, evil things that can be done with static routing and, and, and mucking about with BGP next pop and, and also some risks of um, hijacking the routing resource. Um, uh, broadcast storms are pure hell. I think I can say that some of the worst hours that I have ever spent um, in my 20 years of network operations have been caused by layer 2 broadcast storms. And this is basically where um, somehow a loop gets introduced, uh, maybe the spanning tree um, that's supposed to prevent loop detection on a, a layer 2 ethernet fabric fails, the broadcast packet just keeps circulating endlessly. Um, a lot of internet exchanges actually don't use spanning tree precisely because of this. It's not a particularly great protocol. There are proprietary alternatives, um, but um, quite often the, the alternative is you keep one link down and you manually um, enable it if the other link fail, but otherwise, because you can restore the network more quickly that way, then, then you can repair the damage of a broadcast storm. The uh, single biggest cause of broadcast storms is people connecting their own Ethernet switches, extending the layer 2 topology without you knowing about it, not knowing what they're doing. Um, so it's quite difficult, but it is essential to, to try and um, be fairly Stalinistic about what kind of kit people can connect and, 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 and how that interacts with the other kit. But in a bad broadcast storm, not only does it shut down the entire IP and take several hours to recover from that, um, it also makes root cause determination very difficult. You've got um, not so much a smoking gun as a smoking pile, um, and um, it can be quite hard to figure out exactly who caused it. Um, um, other problem with broadcast traffic, it doesn't just harm the actual switch fabric. Um, broadcast packets usually get handled by the CPU and routers, um, can burn a lot of CPU resource. Um, not only does that um, affect the, 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 you know, it can affect the BGP process in the router, which causes root flap across the internet, it can some quite substantial knock-on effect. So, what causes switch containment failure? Um, switches are supposed to only forward stuff with a particular destination MAC address to the port um, that it belongs on. A um, few circumstances where this breaks down, certainly software and hardware failures cause that, uh, which are more or less common depending on, on how reputable your, your switch vendor are. Um, cheap switches, you know, the kind of thing that you would buy in, um, in, in Micro Center or Fry's or somewhere like that um, um, to connect your home kit to, these generally are not designed for industrial strength. They'll have a limited content addressable memory table size, 
Um, if you actually introduce traffic into that switch that's too many source addresses, it fills the cam up, what does the switch do in that? It just reverts to being a hub and it forwards all traffic to all ports. Um, so you've lost the security of, 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 of being a switch. Best way to avoid this is um, don't use deep and nasty switches for um, internet exchanges. If the, um, the switch vendor also happens to sell cables and washing machines and DSL routers and, 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 and stuff like that, then probably you don't want to buy one. You probably want to buy it from someone whose business is like doing switch manufacture, router manufacture. Um, the better ones don't just um, do the Mac um, switching that destination port right. They can also do things like only limit the, the number of Mac addresses per port to a specific number or, or, or to do other kinds of filtering. Um, problem broadcast traffic. Um, as I say, um, really the only broadcast traffic you need, the only thing you connect an internet exchange to router. If you get a router connected, um, the only thing that you only need to broadcast stuff between these routers is ARP. Um, if there's anything other than ARP, if there's more than a few ARP packets per second, that is abnormal condition. If you don't do something about it, something bad's going to happen eventually. Um, likewise, there shouldn't be any layer 3 IP broadcast traffic. Uh, I mean, that, that is wide open to, to smurf attacks anyway. Um, but um, there's a whole bunch of protocols like DHCP, SMB, BIOS, internal gateway protocols, internal routing protocols, device discovery. Again, it shouldn't be there. Um, ARP um, is a, a protocol where there's spoofing abuse possible. Um, some IXPs actually insist on hardwiring the, the ARP to IP address mapping. Um, others use more advanced filtering techniques, um, depending on, on, on how much clue the spend managed to absorb over the past years of this kind of stuff. Um, you can't always trust an ISP, to be honest, um, when it comes to interacting with other ISPs. There, 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 there's some, some bad guys out there. I hope there are less bad guys than there used to be, but. Um, um, you know, sometimes uh, exchanges have had to do stuff to um, check out um, ISPs or spammers, for example. But default dumping, um, I'm just going to dump all my traffic on this other guy across the exchange. He's not going to know about it, but I'm going to get free outbound traffic. Um, or you can do that for particular destinations. Maybe there's somebody who's, who's here with you, but you really need to get to one of their sites. Um, um, Nixpop spoofing, BGP advertises a Nixpop destination address. Um, you can change what that NICPOP is, and that can cause some curious things as well. Um, the worst abuse case that I had to deal with was this dodgy ISP operating out of London who um, basically connected to our exchange, connected to one of the big exchanges in the US, um, set up some static tunnels, and um, was basically had a website that said, oh, we are a major international transatlantic infrastructure player, and actually they didn't. They were, they were ripping off three other people's bandwidth. Um, so that was an interesting exercise that resulted in their pit being seized by Scotland Yard, and I don't ever want to experience dealing with that kind of thing again. Um, other kinds of routing abuse are, are, are much harder. Most BGP sessions are MD5 these days. So, okay, there's lots of stuff that can go wrong. How do you prevent and detect that? Um, I think it's very important to have a clear policy for what is and is not acceptable practice. So people know what the rules are. Um, there's a whole bunch of documents out there. Um, there's a couple I've been involved in writing the URLs there. Um, but it's not just about having a clear policy. It's also about monitoring that that policy is complied with and enforcing it when it doesn't happen. Um, there's um, custom software called IXP Watch being written, which just sits and looks at all the broadcast traffic in exchange and use that to figure out whether things are working properly, whether there's strange stuff going on. Um, you can use Armon to actually um, look at the packets on the wire. Um, NetFlow and SFlow that actually tell how much traffic is being exchanged between a pair of destinations or between a pair of ports can be very useful for picking up strange stuff. Um, in general, routers that are, are dedicated boxes are much easier to secure than connecting a general purpose server. Once you get to a general purpose server, that box gets owned, then there's all kinds of things that, it, it, that, that you can get up to with it that, that would disrupt the exchange. Uh, that's not to say you can't do evil stuff with, with, with routers that are on dedicated boxes, but in general it's harder. Some exchanges actually have rules that say you cannot connect a um, general purpose server. Uh, um, and again, a lot of these accidents are prevented if this part of the, the switch filter high Okay, um, I want to talk a bit about regional internet exchanges. Um, these are more challenging. Um, once you've established a need for a large exchange and, and built up critical mass, then, then um, all you have to do is put with the, 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 the 90 point gorilla of, of 90 point gorilla of traffic growth. Uh, you want to set up a regional exchange, it can be more difficult. Um, 
my experience, one of the single biggest problems is that um, most of the eyeballs, the people in the DSL connect, cable connect, in any given metro area, are locked into two or three Mabels or, 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 or cable operators. Generally, they will do their peering, their exchange connection centrally, um, somewhere over on the west of the East Coast or Chicago or somewhere like that. And there won't be either the people with the administrative decision-making power or the technical clue in the local organization um, to necessarily um, connect up to an exchange within a given city or metro area. Um, sometimes there's issues with the infrastructure in terms of finding a site that, that's both neutral and both quality and quality. Maybe all the data centers owned by the ISO itself, or um, um, maybe um, the, the common facilities aren't up to uh, the industrial strength standard. Um, sometimes um, there will be a lack of competition in the market, um, and actually buying local books at sufficient capacity from the, the local ISPs up to the city's internet exchange will be expensive, and that can create a barrier. Um, making sure there's enough technical glue to go around, um, I mean, that, that's not. It's not hard, but there is an education process quite often needed there, um, BGP 101. Um, sometimes the, the entry-level technical resources can be an issue. That's more of an issue in developing countries. Um, it's very much less. As I say, you can pick up all the kit you need off baby of these days for a few hundred bucks. It's much less of a problem than it used to be. Political interference. Um, the, the, I have come across local politicians who, um, as I say, see the... Um, the internet exchange is a way of forwarding their career and looking high tech, and, and, and actually um, they do very little in terms of the real getting the traffic on the wire that's necessary. But one of the biggest challenges, and, and one that's, that, that's caused failures, um, is the cost of transit. Um, in many ways it's a good thing, uh, but since, since Y2K, um, the cost of buying wholesale transit has dropped from hundreds of dollars per meg per month to less than 10. You have to shop around, you have to buy in bulk. You can get internet transit for less than 10, 10 bucks a meg a month. The whole of the cost is consolidation and commoditization. What that means is that money you can save from peering is less than it used to be. 20% of your traffic can be saved by peering. 20% 10 bucks is a whole lot less than 20% of several hundred bucks. But there's a fixed cost associated with the connection and exchange. So these days there's less money to do it. Um, the large IXPs, obviously you've got a volume of traffic there um, that you have the critical mass to provide. But if you're a regional player, the, the second exchange in the city, that can make life a lot harder. I mean, unfortunately, last year there was an exchange in Cape Town, I mean, South African exchange in Johannesburg. The one in Cape Town was non profit. Cape cash flow problems had to lay off all its staff. They had to do something similar in Manchester, although I think they're, they're recovering from that now. So there isn't a completely economic case. What are the other benefits? Um, once you've got this place in the middle, which is where you, you put your internet infrastructure and it's got high bandwidth and low latency, then um, there's a lot of um, incentive. It's a good place to put resources, things like top-level name servers, secondaries for .com or .uk or .us or whatever. Time server. We had all that fun um, at the link in, in Y2K. We managed to get sponsored for three atomic blocks. So we, 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 we put a three atomic block on the Greenwich Meridian line. So the zero-degree line went through the building, and, and that was the Greenwich Electronic Time Project. Um, which was fine until the politicians hijacked it. That's another story. You can do things like performance monitoring measurement tools, um, academic research projects, monitoring how the, the internet performs, how traffic flows across it. These are all good things to do to the exchanges. Um, you can enable new, new, new applications, you've got high bandwidth, you've got low latency. Um, always it improves technical coordination and knowledge here and get technical ISPs interacting and learning from each other. You can create a center of expertise for internet technology. Um, um, local to the region, um, and it's also good for um, coordinating security stuff. Uh, generally, you fairly fast communication, fast human communication center around an exchange to, to, to deal with bad guys. Um, other advantages, um, you can increase diversity and resilience. Maybe you're an ISP, you can only afford one upstream transit, you connect an internet exchange, maybe do a mutual backup arrangement with another ISP, use a different upstream. Um, Reducing latency, I've already mentioned, but I mean, that's particularly important for gaming and multimedia. Um, getting that delay down, uh, doing real tough time stuff. Again, the medium is very efficient, many to many medium, which means that multicast applications work very naturally across the exchange, so it's very efficient. Um, internet exchange get into the business of doing other Ethernet services. Sometimes there's competition sensitivities there, but you can do point to point, point to point, point to Ethernet service. But I think 
important thing is you're building a stakeholder community. You can quite often use that stakeholder community for other things. Probably you want to ring fence or, or Chinese wall the um, trade association activities from the actual running of the exchange. But that can be, again, quite a, a good way of doing technically crucial lobbying. Um, other roles for exchanges, um, you can create a market of buying and selling, transit and other um, services so that you have um, lots of, you can maybe encourage other transit providers, wholesale providers into the region um, to, to sell services whereas they're selling the one at a time it might not be done. Um, if you have a regional academic research non-profit network operator, um, then it may be a very good way for them to, to handle their external connectivity um, and not have lots of ad hoc arrangements. Um, we did some other interesting other stuff in London, um, unbundling DSL. Um, you want to resell DSL, the carrier will quite often require you to get a big fat bite. Maybe you're not a large enough ISP to do that. Um, we actually had ISPs who were big enough to buy their own pipe, um, ATM pipe from, from, from the, um, the, the telco, and then actually resell fractions of that over LPGP tunnels across um, the, the, the exchange fabric. Um, and other things, um, just acting as a local loop. There, there, there are some players like Packet Exchange who are in the business of um, doing international Ethernet circuit, um, and they like using it as a local loop so much well they bought the company, but that's again another story. Um, why do internet exchanges fail? Um, inability to be reliable or to cope with growth. It's one thing to start, it's another thing to keep this thing going. Um, making exclusive arrangements, okay, I'll, I'll just try and wrap up. Um, exclusive arrangements with polo providers who go out of business, that's what screwed up the exchange in Edinburgh. Um, not building critical mass. Um, I'll skip over this stuff. Summary. Building an internet exchange is not hard. Um, the resources to do it are widely available. Lots of people have done it. There are some cost benefits, but there are a lot more intangible benefits. The hard part are building the critical mass, keeping it viable, um, coping with uh, growth and abuse. Um, but it's all about sharing with others. That, um, my experience always educational and fun. Maybe someday every city will have internet. Anyway, um, there's my contact details. Um, you can get a copy of the presentation and pack up on these, these two slides that I had to skip over. Um, I hope that was useful or interesting. Um, happy to take any questions. Ah, one question back there. No, I connect to an exchange. In Cleveland? Not to my knowledge, no. I mean, um, I don't think that's an initiative that's been done. Um, I know that there was um, an initiative in Dayton um, called the DMIC, um, but I don't know what's happened about that. As far as I'm aware, um, there's an exchange in Columbus. I think there's another one in Cincinnati. And then there's the one in Pittsburgh that I mentioned as well. So, uh, so yeah, I don't know. Maybe Cleveland can do this one in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, these were kind of abstract diagrams. Um, in general, the topology that most internet exchanges will do is some kind of ring. Um, and um, you can either run, um, the, 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 you can try running spanning tree around that, and as I say, that comes with some health warning. Um, or there are various um, proprietary technologies for you know, marking down one link in the ring and then if it breaks. Uh, but in general, you'll have a core, which is probably a ring, maybe you have two spurs off that for a satellite site, and then the ISPs all connect into the edge of that. I'm sorry, Adam. Um, you can pretty much do it for nothing because you'll probably find some switch vendor out there who's so keen to be associated with an internet exchange they'll lend you a switch for free. And whether the switch is any good or not, I don't know. Um, but um, you, you need about a rack worth of space, which 
cost you a few thousand a year. Um, and um, you need a half Ethernet, Ethernet switch, which um, depending on whether you you or, or, or off eBay, it will cost you a few hundred or a few thousand. Um, and then most of the other costs are for the ISP participants. You know, they need to hook up to that, they need to have a circuit into the building, they need to have space for the route. Uh, so, so yeah, it can be done reasonably cheaply. Um, that, that, that's a very interesting question. Part of what's driving that is that um, peering arrangements quite often happen um, in the business between what we call eyeball providers, which is, you know, DSL and cable, and the people in the end of them, and content providers. And obviously, at and is now big in the eyeball business, um, whereas the likes of Google, Yahoo, uh, broadcasting, people like that have a lot of content. Um, because the likes of Google have so much power in the market, they have been very reluctant to um, enter into peering agreements with anyone unless there's something in it for them. So this is obviously AT&T trying to use its new muscle um, to, to turn the table on them. Um, I suspect that um, the market will probably balance things up there. Um, there have been some attempts to do regulation of um, the settlement, the traffic exchange between ISPs, but in general, um, something that, that survives reasonably well. It's something that um, regulators like the FTC or Ofcom actually don't understand terribly well. Um, and uh, so I, I hope that that one will, will, will play out sensibly. And uh, I, 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 I don't think that actually quality of service is very meaningful in these environments. Because if you've got 100 ISPs with 200 hearings at an exchange, are you then going to multiply that by four different classes of quality of service? Uh, I think that's too complicated. So um, I think it's it's cage rattling. Um, it will probably play out. Uh, but but yeah, it's an interesting question. Okay, thank you very much. Ah, my wife.